Welcome everybody to this first event uh, in this academic year of our occasional series on human rights in hard places. My name is Matthias Rüsse and I am the director of the Car Center for Human Rights Policy. And in fact, this event is not only the first one in this particular series, this is the first event, this whole, this, the first content event, uh, this whole academic year that we are doing. So I am delighted to welcome you back to another year at the Car Center for Human uh, Rights Policy here at the Harvard Kennedy School. The title of this event uh, is Afghanistan, the path forward and the overall context, unfortunately, needs only very little introduction. Just this week, the Taliban announced their new leadership, the new cabinet. Uh, many had been hopeful that this new cabinet would be put together not only with an eye on unifying the movement and formalizing the functioning of the government, but also in a way that honors the earlier promises of inclusivity. Unfortunately, these hopes for now have been disappointed. That new cabinet that was appointed this week does not include any women and it was drawn largely from former leaders of the Taliban's repressive regime of the 1990s. That is where we stand for now. Uh, and we have to, and the, the purpose of this particular discussion today, Afghanistan, the path forward, is to see what the path forward from here might be. And in that spirit, it gives me great pleasure introducing our terrific uh, panelists for today. We are honored to have uh, three experts in Afghanistan um, with us here. Uh, there's, uh, first of all, there's uh, Yelda Hakim. Uh, Yelda Hakim uh, was born in Kabul, but her family fled the country during the Soviet-Afghan war just a few months after her birth. They eventually settled in Australia, where Yelda has since become a broadcast journalist, a news presenter, and a documentary maker. And specifically, Yelda is a well-known figure for being a presenter on uh, BBC World News. Um, Yalda, unfortunately, is not no longer here on the screen. She actually couldn't make this particular time this morning, but we recorded a um, brief interview with her just an hour ago, which we will be uh, with streaming uh, after these introductions. Vashma uh, Zasarat, who was also born in Kabul. Vashma's uh, family left the country when the Taliban threatened the lives of Afghan civilians. And they then joined millions of displaced Afghans who crossed border in search of education. After the fall of the Taliban, Vajma's family returned to Kabul, where she finished high school and traveled to the United States for the first time as a high school exchange student. And eventually, Vajma would become the first Afri Afghan woman to graduate from Yale College and then also attended Yale Law School. She's currently based in Maryland, just finished clerking and is about to join a law firm there. And because of this educational record, Vashma very much stands for the new Afghanistan that has emerged uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the last decade uh, or so. Uh, Vashma will be uh, talking uh, to us about the challenges that the Taliban face uh, and what, what the best uh, the specifically can do to prevent Afghanistan from becoming a hub tourism again. And our third speaker for today is Rory Stewart, who is currently a senior fellow at uh, Yale's Jackson Institute for Global Affairs, where he teaches politics and international relations. Prior to that appointment, Rory has served, Rory served as a minister in several different departments of the UK government under Theresa May. And he was a member of the British Parliament between 2010 and 2019. And before that, before 2010, I am very happy to report Rory actually was the director of the Car Center for Human Rights Policy here. Uh, and during that time, uh, the sensitivity of the Car Center was what Rory then called the Afghan program, the Afghan Pakistan program. And Rory generally has uh, intersected with Afghanistan at uh, different stages um, in, uh, in, in his life. Uh, and Rory will speak to us about the uh, international policy situation around Afghanistan currently. The, uh, the, 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 he will take stock a little bit of the state building effort that, uh, that has happened in Afghanistan and what the future of that state building effort might now be given that uh, the Taliban is back in charge. And having said all that, uh, let us hear from um, Yalda. Let's uh, listen to the interview with Yalda that we just did before. So, Yalda, thank you for being here with us under these uh, difficult circumstances. Thank you for um, making this work. Uh, so let's uh, let's right get to it. Uh, so you have been 
Uh, you have a lot of experience with Afghanistan. Obviously, you were born there. You were there uh, as recently as just a few weeks before the fall. You have interacted quite a bit with the Taliban. Mm -hmm. uh, and right now, everybody is deeply worried, especially this week, given that we now have a cabinet that seems to belie the earlier uh, promises uh, on inclusivity, especially there's no women at all in the cabinet. Is this as bad uh, as it looks? I was uh, in Kabul just weeks before uh, the fall, and I spent some time first in Doha with the leadership of, of the Taliban who were negotiating um, with the United States and then with the Afghan government. I spent time with the political office there. And I have to say um, that in some ways, uh, I realized that they, there was a real charm offensive that was taking place. They were saying all the right things uh, that, 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 you know, that I wanted to know about. So whether that was about women's rights or, or inclusivity or how they would deal with minority uh, groups or, or girls' education, women working, they were saying to me things like, we made mistakes in the past. Um, we don't want to see a return to the 90s. We want to see a more progressive Afghanistan and Afghanistan for all Afghans uh, that's inclusive and not a pariah state. I then went uh, to Kabul and met with some Taliban uh, foot soldiers and commanders who were at the time fighting in places like Helmand and they come to the Afghan capital to meet with me. And I have to say, uh, you know, that it was exactly the same lines of uh, the 90s, that they wanted to impose their own form of strict Sharia law they didn't want girls to go to school beyond the age of 12. Um, and, and the commander I was speaking to first started off by saying he didn't want the girls to go to school beyond the age of 12. Then he changed his mind to 10. By the end of that conversation, he felt the girls shouldn't go to school at all. Uh, so it gave you a sense of just how fickle their views are um, on, on a girls' education and, and uh, women working and participating in society. So I suppose Fast forward um, three weeks, three or four weeks since the fall of Kabul, I have to say that in my conversations and interactions with both the um, Afghan um, sort of um, leaders and 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 um, you know elders in the country, as well as the Taliban, um, I you get a sense that they weren't quite prepared for the capital to fall as quickly as it did. You know, I went to Suhail Shaheen, the uh, spokesperson of the Taliban, the morning that, that uh, Kabul uh, had been surrounded by the Taliban. And I said to him, you know, we have terrified young women in Kabul, really concerned that, that there's going to be a, a bloodbath in the capital. What are your intentions? And he said to me, we're not going to enter the capital. We're waiting on the outskirts and we're waiting for a delegation to leave uh, from Kabul, come to Doha and discuss the next steps, a handover of power. And I suppose it wasn't even a negotiation at that point because it was basically a negotiation with, with a gun to their head. So they, you know, they, they were going bold. And I, and I had conversations with people like Hamid Karzai who said, the Taliban have not come into Kabul. They have not entered Kabul. We are planning on sending a, a delegation with Dr. Abdullah to Doha to discuss the next steps. So they themselves were caught by surprise by the fall of Kabul and how quickly they had to. And so when you look at their interim or caretaker government now, I suppose it's a response to the almost chaos that the country, people debating, asking for their rights. This is something that's unprecedented and for, for the Taliban. They don't know how to deal with this. They don't know how to deal with who are prepared to spare barrel of a gun and say, okay, shoot me. I have nothing to lose now. I know what, what is likely to happen to me. I have a reference point. The 90s are my reference point. Many of the other younger, uh, younger uh, demonstrators, female demonstrators, are saying to me that, you know, our mothers lived under the Taliban, not us. So we're not afraid. We will do what it takes to make sure that we hang on to the freedoms uh, that we that we know that we, we have had and enjoyed for the last 20 years. So this case government um, is really in many ways not just a, a response to all of that, but also them scrambling to put things together quite quickly. And what we see then from this caretaker government is they're all Talib, all men, and all dealing with, with the, the, the spoils of war, people who were 
very much at the forefront of their insurgency over the last 20 years, being rewarded uh, for, for putting up this fight. And as they see it, defeating the greatest military alliance in history and defeating the United States. So in many ways, they're scrambling as well. But but there are things that have been back. Uh, for example, you know, they talked to me in Doha about the return of uh, religious police to monitor the behavior of people. We're seeing that uh, those departments making a comeback uh, in the country. So I think the Taliban only know how to rule with fear and, and, and sort of know how to rule by, by putting in tough and, 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 and really quite frightening policies in place. But they're now dealing with a generation of Afghans who are fearless and who know what the Taliban are likely to do with them. And, and so they are unafraid, they're courageous. But I suppose that the question is, is their cr uh, courage, is their bravery enough uh, to take on uh, this new um, sort of Afghanistan and this, this group of, of mostly men. Um, and we have seen demonstrations over the last uh, day or so of of women who the Taliban say are supportive of their rule. Um, but but they are mostly men and they have come into power. And it's one, one though governing a district or a province. And it's another thing governing an entire country and governing in a way that's acceptable to the international community. And so will really be uh, what the Taliban do next, but also what the international community will do next. Do they have the willpower to hold the Taliban accountable? Do they have the leverage? Because from what we can see up until this point, they haven't really used any of the leverage they have. And, and the Taliban know this and they know how to use it. So what, um, what's striking here is really also the end to which Afghanistan is now a very different country from what it was when the Taliban were last in charge and also how it's positioned very differently in the world. And so, so what I mean is uh, there's a lot of people in the world from Afghanistan who have made their, who have built a life like, like you, uh, have built on your family, have built a life elsewhere. They know a lot about Afghanistan. They pay attention to Afghanistan. They remind the rest of the world of Afghanistan. So that has changed. And of course, as you mentioned, uh, the, 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 current generation of young people, including young women, they have grown up in 20 years without the Taliban. So there's going to be a very, there's a very different civil society uh, in Afghanistan at the state. Do you think these factors will make a difference as we go forward and they will, they, they might, they might give, they might compel even these hardline Taliban who are now being rewarded with cabinet positions for their military engagement to rethink what's possible and what's what's uh, what's 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 worth trying in the country i think uh the taliban is desperate for legitimacy and although their actions over the last few days uh sort of doesn't show that they want to uh gain legitimacy whether that's a cabinet to get made up of people with bounties on their heads or um on fbi watch lists or you know accused of of um unleashing horror um, against the Afghan people over 20 years, as well as on Americans and, and uh, their allies over the last 20 years. And, and, and um, really, so many of the people in that cabinet have blood on their hands um, in terms of the things that they're accused of doing. Um, however, they, they do want legitimacy. They are concerned about the sanctions that are in place. There is a harsh winter around the corner, and there are concerns by um, the United Nations and, and humanitarians to say, you know, we need to be able to work with the Taliban to ensure that, that Afghans themselves don't suffer, that ordinary Afghans do, themselves don't suffer. There are so many Afghans who live below the poverty line who will go hungry in the next few weeks and months. Um, we're already seeing a humanitarian crisis in the Panjshir Valley, which has been cut off um, from, from the rest of the country. And that situation is likely to get um, even worse and more dire as the fighting rages on. And the Taliban have claimed that they have taken over the Panjshir. But when you speak to um, the anti-Taliban resistance fighters, they say they will carry on fighting for as long as it takes it valley and they're going to fight for freedom and justice and for the rights of their people. So the Taliban are dealing with, with a very different 
uh, sort of Afghanistan and, and arrangements now. At the same time, they do want this legitimacy. And so you, even if you take the demonstrations, for example, you know, there were women who were able to, and men, uh, several hundred of them, who were able to demonstrate for about five minutes, an hour, under the, 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 the watchful eye of the Taliban, um, you know, and, and, and do so quite peacefully before another group of Taliban uh, arrived and, and started to shoot in the air and, and cause uh, disruption and start beating people up, including journalists who they, they tortured and beat up brutally. And so, you know, there is this almost, perhaps there is a disconnect between the foot soldiers and the frontline commanders and the leadership, because when I do have these conversations with the leadership about why are these journalists being beaten up and why are people not able to demonstrate? They do say all the things that you want to say, like, well, no, people should have the right to peacefully protest and we're, we're trying to figure out what the best way uh, to go about this is and no one should be beaten, no one should be harmed, there shouldn't be the use of violence. And yet the actions on the ground are completely different to what we're seeing uh, from and hearing from from the actual leadership, so it, it will come down to you know these brave, incredibly brave Afghans who remain in the country, and there are 38 million Afghans who remain in the country who are not willing to give up their freedoms, who are not willing to give up their rights, and who are willing to okay. do whatever it takes to hang on for as long as it takes. Thank you, guys. Obviously, many, many more things uh, that we could raise in, in this conversation. Uh, but uh, this, this is a pre-recording for the typical thing that we're doing later. And I know you have to go, so we are tremendously grateful that you could make this work with us uh, this morning. Thank you so much. And now, without further ado, I turn over to Vashma. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Wajma, and I'll be focusing on the Taliban as, as a movement and, and as a government and kind of looking at what, what lies ahead of them as, as a government. Um, I must share with you that uh, the past few weeks um, have been very deeply personal to me, um, as horrifying as it was for the rest of the world, but for Afghans um, with families, um, I'm, I'm, I'm here with you. And uh, it was incredibly difficult. Um, I spent two harrowing weeks trying to take um, my brother and his family out of out of the country. Luckily, we were successful, but there were so many who, who were not, in, and there are so many who are and will be targeted by the Taliban. And there is no doubt about that among the Afghans. Um, who, who lived under the Taliban and uh, there is this unspoken code of, um, you know, um, Afghans um, among locals that we understand the Taliban way more than anybody um, would understand regardless of what they say and do now. Um, so with that just in mind, um, I will be talking a lot about the Taliban as a movement, as, 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 a, as a movement that I've studied probably since, since um, their, their start until now, um, but I'll be drawing on my personal experiences and I look forward to questions um, from both of those ends really uh, to share with you how it was to live under the Taliban but also to share with you what this movement is and signifies, uh, not just for Afghanistan, but for the world. Um, I think it's, um, it, it, I'm actually quite happy that uh, people are being very skeptical of the Taliban uh, this time around. Um, they were pretty much abandoned last time they ruled Afghanistan. And, but it's important to look deeper into, uh, into the challenges that they face. And as Yelda very aptly pointed out, uh, the discrepancies and, 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 and the false promises and the kind of words versus actions that we're seeing from the Taliban. Um, but before I do that, I think I'm very much optimistic that this, this um, government is not going to last um, for a long time. And my, I might be in the minority now. And I, th the reason I, um, I say that is because what made the Taliban successful as a terrorist organization might be the thing, the very thing that would um, lead to its, um, it, its fall on its own. And the reason for that is that as we are seeing in their very first weeks, 
the movement is very much horizontal. It's very much divided and very much chaotic. Um, there's a serious clash of ideas um, and identities among the different fractions of the Taliban. And what united them was the common enemy, um, the US and the former Afghan government, and they had a common goal. And um, once that goal no longer exists, um, they really aren't in agreement with each other on how to rule the country. Um, so I'm not sure how a country like Afghanistan that has really um, seen war for decades and has not been ruled completely ever by the Taliban, even since 1996 to 2001, they were never able to rule the entire country. And then um, we saw how much aid and military support went into the previous governments and still the governments failed. I'm, I'm very skeptical of this movement as a government, um, regardless of how much legitimacy they get from the neighboring countries and otherwise, um, um, uh, I, I, have, uh, I have a strong belief that they will not uh, be able to be successful as a government. As a terrorist organization, though, they, they definitely have proven to be very, very effective, um, unfortunately. Um, and I think at that point I wanted to make before before I, I, I moved on, I move on to another another um, concern that I have about this, and that has to do with um, how much how worrisome it is for me that, the only theme I'm seeing in, in the movement is that the more extreme and the more kind of, um, um, I guess, extreme and horrifying uh, the individual um, Taliban member is, the more rewarded he is for his actions and the more power he gets. And this is very similar to how the movement operated in 1996 to 2001. Um, I remember at some point uh, living under the Taliban, we started to see certain themes and identified and really discriminated based on the appearance of each Taliban member walking on the, on the streets to see how much danger they carried. How um, how much it uh, how how painful it would be if they if they hurt someone on the street if we if we violated the laws and it all had to do with how um, how extremist or how conservative they looked um, which is obviously um, something that we're seeing again the most senior the most uh, horrifying and the most uh, powerful people are the ones that are the most extremist in this new cabinet um, so it's not something to be taken lightly because the movement is pretty much all over the place in terms of its beliefs and if if, if the big guys are the ones that have the strongest and um, the most you know the closest to the terrorists um, and extremist views then um, that is what um, you know represents the movement and that is what represents this government um, the second point I wanted to focus on is um, this claim that the Taliban will abide by the international laws. I think Yelda mentioned this pretty uh, aptly again about how um, they keep saying the right things. Um, but even when they say the right things, there is um, a little bit of, you know, they do leave um, a caveat and they do kind of uh, tell us where they're headed to. I don't think they are uh, bluntly saying, um, you know, that they are going to abide by the international law. What they're saying is that they will abide by um, the international laws as long as they're not in conflict with uh, Sharia law and their country's values. Those two things are to me both very, very amorphous, very, very important, and, and in so many ways, very, very manipulative. Um, I think it leaves a, a huge room for the Taliban to interpret anything that's Western as anti-Islam, anti-Afghan. Um, but I do want to focus on this religious laws as well as the Afghan values and kind of challenge that. I think the Afghans staying in Afghanistan as well as the Afghan uh, diaspora uh, can really have, you know, the, the legal term would be the standing to really challenge that and, and ask them, what set of Islamic values are you talking about when you say this? Because um, the way we understand Islam is very different from that. This is a body of law that is very, very um, uh, much open to interpretation. It has been interpreted differently in different contexts throughout the 1400 years. And so the way the Taliban interpret this, where does this come from? Um, what does this mean? Um, does this mean, for example, last night I read that uh, women, um, the cricket, uh, athlete and cricket players were not allowed, female cricket 
players were not allowed to participate in the sport because it's against Islamic law, according to according to uh, the Taliban. Really questioning that. What does that mean for you? Uh, where do you get the set of interpretations? And and a lot of these things, I think, stop um, um, by by the rest of the world, where they you know use the the Islam card or the Afghan values card, and 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 the West or the world would be a little bit hesitant to kind of push that because they don't want to come off as you know intervening in in in, in, in another country's you know set of values. But really, these values are not Afghan; they are not Muslim, and I think that's something that really has to be challenged and and will be challenged. Um, but they're being challenged by these protests as well as the uh, uh, the, the world at large now. But um, it was something that was never kind of looked closely into in 1996 to 2001. So I think um, for me, this this idea of uh, Islam being used and Afghan values being used as as their weapon to kind of justify what they do is completely uh, illegitimate and, and manipulative um, and and quite quite worrisome. Um, similarly, Afghan values to me is is just so so amorphous and different in a country that there are over uh, forty different languages, several tribes, uh, and even within the Pashtun a tribe, which uh, which can uh, which is the majority of, of the country's population. There's so many different Pashtuns, so many different dialects, so many different value systems. And so this particular value system that they're referring to has never been defined. Um, the Taliban kind of went ahead and defined those values based on what they thought of in 1996 to 2001. There was no written law. There was no written rule from the very beginning. One day we would hear that somebody was beaten up because they were wearing um, white colored pants. And we would learn later on that the justification for that was that that was the color of their flag. Well, where does that come from? Uh, where can we refer to to kind of look at this this rule this this book of rules um, that define their values and 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 uh, kind of um, laws to follow. Um, so I think this this time around they will not be able to um, to be successful because there's a lot of um, international attention to the movement. There's a lot of resistance from the from the inside and uh, and people know now um, that if 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 they're kind of left there to their own devices, it will not just um, cause Afghan lives and, and Afghan uh, prosperity in the future of Afghanistan, but it could really go really not just beyond the borders, but but uh, threaten world security. Um, so I really hope that we don't um, abandon this country this time around and really pay attention and continue the dialogue and, and really push this movement uh, uh, and to see that they cannot just legitimize and, and make terrorism legal in the world, by simply explaining it through whatever interpretation they have, um, which are neither Islamic nor Afghan. Um, I will stop there and, and I look forward to hearing more questions and, and please do ask me questions, not just about these topics, but anything Afghanistan, I would love to answer. Thank you and I'll pass it on to Rory now. So I, I'm gonna speak, uh, I hope quite briefly, um, having heard the contributions um, from Jan Verne and Wajma. But, but in a sense, what I hope to bring a little bit is the perspective from the point of view of somebody who was a British politician and before that a British diplomat and worked in nonprofits on the ground in Afghanistan as an international. Um, clearly quite a lot of the story of Afghanistan over the last 50 years, is not just an internal story about Afghanistan, but it's a story of foreign countries involved in Afghanistan. Famously, of course, that was the Russian uh, invasion and occupation in the 1980s. It was the presence of the United States and 40 other NATO countries on the ground in Afghanistan uh, over the last 20 years. And of course, it was the involvement of other players, most notably Pakistan, which was a very, very major player in the formation of the Taliban in the mid 90s and continues to have links to them to this day, and to a lesser extent, but still significant countries like Iran. So I think the first thing to understand in framing what's happening in Afghanistan is to be conscious of the fact that it's very tempting to sort of suggest, as sometimes President Biden seems to be implying, that everything that's happened in Afghanistan is purely internal to Afghanistan, and that somehow by the US leaving, he's going to allow Afghans to sort things out amongst themselves. 
Uh, there are many problems with that. But the first problem is, of course, that it isn't leaving Afghans to settle things out amongst themselves. It is, of course, creating a vacuum into which countries like Pakistan, Iran, and potentially other nations like China can then flow. But I think the other thing to understand is that there is something very naive about the idea of Afghans somehow sorting things out amongst themselves. What does that mean? And what does it mean if you are a teacher, maybe a female teacher in Puli Kumri, and you see Taliban trucks roll into your town with large heavy machine guns on the back? How are you supposed to, in inverted commas, sort this out amongst yourselves when one side has weapons and the other side does not? Um, one of the naiveties, and, and actually you can see this now happening as people come to the support of Biden. I'm increasingly finding myself encountering people, particularly from the left, but not only from the left, also, in fact, actually from the sort of Trumpian right in the United States, suggesting that somehow the Taliban represent the real voice of the Afghan people. And the fact that the Afghan government collapsed so quickly in the Afghan and the Taliban government took over so quickly implies that somehow the Taliban are a, a legitimate democratic force. This simply isn't true. Uh, the Taliban have not entered these communities in the central and the north with people coming out with flags, uh, welcoming them. Essentially, people were faced with a tragic choice between an almost suicidal resistance to the Taliban after the US had essentially crippled the Afghan Air Force. The US had withdrawn uh, 18,000 contractors who were maintaining all the Afghan planes, they'd maintained their own close air support, they'd re removed their own close air support and their own aircraft and had left Afghans with this choice between a suicidal resistance or accepting the Taliban coming into these towns. But the story is certainly not, and this is something that we can see in, in a recent New Yorker article that many of you may have read by Anand Gopal, it is not that the whole of Afghanistan was somehow uh, in a situation where their experience of the Afghan government, of, of Ashraf Ghani's Afghan government was so horrifying that the Taliban was an immense improvement, right? That may feel the case in certain areas. So Anand Gopal's piece in the New Yorker focuses on a particular place called Sangin in Helmand. And it's certainly true in Helmand that they have had the most horrifying experience over 20 years and more, in fact, over 50 years of predatory, abusive, corrupt government by various warlords, compared to whom in certain areas, the Taliban at least appear to be able to bring peace and security. But that is not true of the Bamiyan a province in central Afghanistan. That's not true for Herat. That's not true for Kabul. That's not true for much northern Afghanistan. Um, and I want to finish maybe with that and then open up to the conversation because those two points, firstly, let's not forget the international dimension here. Let's not forget the ways in which internationals have helped to cause these problems, both through uh, a very, very heavy intervention, particularly from 2005 to 2014, which ended up with 130,000 international troops on the ground and an expenditure of $100 billion a year and the ways in which that actually made things worse rather than better. And then by the lurch to the equally bad decision to withdraw, avoiding the possibility of what I think was the more sane and rational position, which was a light footprint. So neither the surge nor the total withdrawal, but some attempt to maintain a moderate, pragmatic, difficult engagement with an Afghan government. Right? That's the international dimension. And then the second thing, of course, this issue of the fact that be very, very careful of anybody who tries to suggest that the Taliban represent the real voice of Afghans, that somehow this is a great relief that the Taliban have, as they try to suggest their propaganda saved Afghanistan from enormous numbers of civilian casualties, brought peace and security for the first time, kicked out an occupying government. That is not the experience of many Afghans. I would suggest not the experience of most Afghans, for whom the Taliban is simply another armed group representing often very, very strange uh, ethnic, tribal, and international alliances with places like Pakistan that has imposed itself in the end, largely at the, at the point of a gun. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so I'd like to encourage all members of our audience to put their questions uh, in the YouTube chat. We are monitoring that. There's a number of questions already. Um, and the questions that are there already are also very much reflecting what is generally on people's minds about Afghanistan. And um, among those questions, so people wonder what is the 
what's the future, what, what, is, what will be coming out of Afghanistan? Yeah? So what is the role of Afghanistan as also a possible staging ground for additional acts of terrorism going forward? So what's Afghanistan going to be to the rest of the world? Another, uh, another set of questions around what is going to happen, of course, specifically in Afghanistan itself, the human rights situation in Afghanistan, uh, and uh, specifically then also the uh, the treatment of women. So, so let me maybe start with the with the former uh, with, the, with the former complex of questions around what is Afghanistan uh, to the to the world, and maybe both of you um, uh, could speak to that. Um, Vashma, if you wouldn't mind turning your video actually back on, so that we can all be on the on the screen. Uh, if you um, would would mind addressing this question, so how do you see the is 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 it how likely is it that Afghanistan is going to be the staging ground for future acts of terrorism executed in other parts of the world. Maybe Vajma turning to you first on that. Yes, I think um, I think there is a true possibility and a strong possibility that Afghanistan will again become um, the hotbed for terrorism if the Taliban continue to rule. Um, I think there might be several reasons for this, but the ones that I think to me are the most obvious is that it's very easy for Afghanistan to isolate itself this geographically. I mean, we saw the evacuation and we saw how um, strategic the Taliban were in taking over Afghanistan. They kind of started from the outskirts of Kabul and they kind of started from all sides and, and kind of went in, um, leaving no room for someone to leave. And it's very hard to um, get to Afghanistan if you have the borders under under the control of the Taliban, and also the the mountainous nature of the the, the country made it so hard for uh, the international troops. Despite how how much uh, funding or, or or resources they put into um, fighting terrorism to really be able to dismantle the Taliban, that is a, a terrorist organization that did function as a terrorist organization until they took over weeks before they took over Kabul. They were uh, uh, carrying out suicide bombs all over against the civilians, creating fears, targeting um, unarmed civilians. So it's a pretty textbook definition of, of a terrorist organization. And I think um, as the Taliban become more dependent on, uh, on, on outside aid, which they will again, geographically, it's, it's much harder for Afghanistan to be economically, economically independent. In fact, the country has never been economically in, independent in, 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 in thousands of years. Um, and so, they will turn to um, terrorist organizations to, to make these deals just like before. I, I cannot um, see any other ways for the Taliban to, to continue governing the country, continue making um, the, the economy, the, the, the governing work without uh, the intervention of, of other countries, um, both neighboring countries and other countries that would uh, love to funnel terrorism into Afghanistan, use Afghanistan as a, as a very uh, dark um, backyard or of some sort uh, to have their, their dirty businesses done there. Um, I, I, I don't think it's, it's unrealistic or un, un, uh, unfathomable to think that the, the country will pretty much turn into, into a hotbed for terrorism. But now as, as Ruri um, really distinguished the provinces that you know, had different experiences, I'm not suggesting that, let's say, um, there will be another Al-Qaeda um, you know, uh, running their camps in, 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 in Kabul. But, but I do see that some provinces of Afghanistan will become the host for terrorism if the Taliban continue to stay. I think um, there is an argument that this could be prevented now that there's more attention, there's more, hopefully there is, there, there is more uh, demand for the Taliban to be, um, you know, uh, less isolation, uh, um, isolationists, um, but I don't know how much they would, they, they would, they would, um, they would, they would cooperate uh, with the rest of the world and, and making sure that terrorism does not um, uh, become, you know, like the the bread and butter of, of what the Taliban actually do and trade and, and bring to a country. I, I, I agree with a lot of what Wajman said. I, I think there's a, I, I think the first thing to understand is of course, that Afghanistan under the Taliban will pose a threat. And the problem in the US discourse is that, partly for political reasons, American politicians have lurched from exaggerating the threat from Afghanistan to now underestimating the threat. So they've lurched from saying, 
Afghanistan is the existential threat to global security. All the bad things in the world come from Afghanistan, which was the story a few years ago to justify $130 billion uh, you know, dollars of expenditure a year and 130,000 troops. To now effectively saying, oh, it's no threat at all. We can't even maintain 2,500 soldiers there. It doesn't justify the smallest investment, right? So it's a very, very odd aspect of this sort of rhetorical inflation, which is part of US foreign policy. And what's lacking is a thoughtful, realistic, moderate account of what we're dealing with here. And what we're dealing with here is clearly, firstly, a jihadi group. I mean, the, the man who has just been made, the interior minister, has organized for years with the backing of the Pakistan ISI suicide bombs uh, in Afghanistan, and killed a lot of civilians with suicide bombs. He's now the interior minister of the country. And the victory of the Taliban on the 20th anniversary, effectively, of 9 11 will be greeted by jihadi groups from the Sahel across as an extraordinary victory. And this then calls into question what on earth is going on in President Biden's mind or indeed in US foreign policy in general, because what you would expect is um, the pendulum to swing from a more extreme, maybe George W. Bush description of global war on terror to a more moderate position, which says this is one problem amongst others. We have to think about Afghanistan and Yemen and Syria and many other, and Sahel and many other places. In, instead of which we've had this very weird lurch under President Biden from a world under President Obama where it justified 100,000 troops to a world in which it justifies exactly zero, from a world in which we say, this is the existential threat of global security to a world in which we say, we really don't care about it at all. And I think that is, you know, intuitively strikes me as being wrong. And it suggests something very, very worrying about the way in which US foreign policy operates and makes me very anxious about the future. Rory, since we are just uh, hearing from you, there's actually one question here that um, uh, that is specifically for you from somebody uh, living in Cumbria, actually. Uh, so um, they are asking, um, what are the effects of recent developments on the wider region, specifically uh, the near future of Pakistan and possible ramifications on India? Well, I, I think the first thing to bear in mind is that um, from the point of view of the security elite, particularly the intelligence security elite in India and in Pakistan, Afghanistan has always been seen as a critical uh, position for continuing a war between India and Pakistan. And the Pakistan ISI in particular has had a doctrine almost since partition where they've been worried that Indian presence and good relationships with Afghanistan can undermine their fight with India. So we are now in a situation in which it is very likely that um, we're going to find ourselves with Pakistan trying to use the Taliban victory to reassert its control over Afghanistan. Uh, the head of the Pakistan Inter-Services Intelligence Agency appeared publicly in Kabul last week in the Serena Hotel, quite openly, happy to be filmed, walking around with a big smile on his face, effectively taking um, credit for the Taliban takeover of the country. Um, that means many, many different things. I mean, I think firstly, you could argue, although we've never managed to convince the Pakistan government of this, that this is actually very, very dangerous, even for Pakistan, that the Pakistan government is itself threatened by jihadi groups and by the Pakistan Taliban, which will only take strength and confidence from having an enormous territory to its west where it can receive safe haven supplies and an ideological support. I think another thing to worry about, and, and this is where I'm particularly concerned as somebody who's engaged with humanitarian and development organizations on the ground, is what any of this means for trying to get assistance through to Afghan communities, run healthcare, run schools, and in two ways. Firstly, that the international community will be tempted to impose sanctions on the Taliban, which will make it very difficult for actually for us to get money through to NGOs and others on the ground. Uh, already, you know, the Taliban ha government has no money. It can't run the electricity and water supply in Kabul. Its engineers are going, I mean, everything's collapsing, right? People are in a horrible situation. But secondly, um, there is, of course, a significant risk that the Taliban government will prove to be extremely fragile, their power very thin, and that we will lapse back into a form of civil war. 
where opponents of the Taliban and opponents of the Pakistan government, which might include the Indian government, will become begin funding other groups to fight the Taliban. Now, I can completely understand why people would want to do that because who the Taliban are, but from the point of view of an Afghan citizen in a rural area, that situation could get much worse. Uh, Vajma, anything to um, add on that? No, I think I completely agree. Um, I do think a lot about what the Western strategy would be for whether it makes sense to engage with the Taliban and providing aid and um, helping Afghan communities who would be who are, um, you know, struggling and, and um, uh, trying to survive poverty, which was already um, quite high even before uh, the events of events of uh, the past few weeks, um, and I don't see a way out for them to kind of um, be able to 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 sustain. And even um, it will be much harder for Afghans now to to go to different countries. The borders that I crossed several times when I was a child during the Taliban in search of peace and education, but also food, um, will be much harder to cross because the Taliban, if in, in one way they are sophisticated, is that they have different fractions and they have really deadly and terrifying um, sub-networks um, across the borders of Pakistan and Afghanistan. Um, same thing to the north of Afghanistan. So it'll be much harder for Afghan communities, Afghan civilians to survive poverty or leave the country. So that's one, one aspect. Do we, do we provide aid? Do we help, um, do we help Afghan communities? Um, does this legitimize the Taliban? Are they going to use this money and aid to, to kind of um, become um, involved in more terrorist activities? But then the other side is that if you, if you isolate them and not engage with them and sanction them, then that also creates a bigger threat. Um, and in terms of India and Pakistan, it's a, it's, it's, um, it's, it, it's a, an incredibly complicated and a very lose-lose situation for Afghanistan because we're just surrounded by the types of neighbors that we have no idea. I mean, as an Afghan citizen, I, I just, um, do not understand what the solution would be for Afghanistan. It's a landlocked country. It depends on a way out to trade and it, does, it depends on a way out to kind of be able to become independent, become sustainable, um, idealistically speaking, be able to you know um, trade over land to the north, to the west, to the south. Uh, but then when you look around there, um, every neighbor and every way that we are trying to make this work just ends up um, backfiring and, and it ends up um, affecting Afghanistan negatively um, um, so I do. I, I, I do think again. One one last point about ISI's involvement that that is something that will definitely uh, play a huge role in in the way Afghans see the Taliban and whether they legitimize Afghans living in Afghanistan legitimize the Taliban will greatly depend on the Taliban's involvement in public appearance with any Pakistan affiliates, which they are not uh, trying to hide at all. I watched the videos of protests where women were right standing against, um, right before a Taliban member and asking him, go back to Pakistan. And why did you bring the ISI people to our country? Why are you working with them? And the Taliban were saying, we don't depend on ISI. We don't depend on Pakistan. This is our country. And there was this back and forth kind of you know each party yelling at each other to kind of um, ask whether you are more Afghan than we are and I think the Taliban are going to have to walk a very um, very difficult path trying to navigate this dependency on Pakistan and ISI and also uh, be able to really uh, win any any hearts of any Afghans who, who really see it clearly what what they're about uh, about to. Um, Rajma, to follow up uh, with you on uh, on, a, on a related matter, so you have uh, now talked repeatedly also about the the, the different fractions uh, of of the Taliban. So, I was wondering whether there is any hope uh, that there is a, one of these factions would be thinking roughly as follows. So, let me give you a bit of a wishful thinking version of you know what what, what some fraction might be thinking so they could be thinking look it's uh, it's 20 years after we have been in power last this is a very different country now the people who have grown up um in in the meantime are very different generations they're not just going to put up with things that they are their elders uh, put up uh, 20 years ago. So and if we have to we have to be more inclusive in order to have some kind of stability here. And in addition, we also have to send that kind of signal in order to generate any kind of international cooperation, which in turn 
we need in order the you know, somebody mentioned the harsh winter coming right so in order just to deal with basic hardship and of course they have a they have something to trade with right since one thing we have learned in the last decade about afghanistan is that they actually have a lot of uh, rare methods there so they could actually build some economic strength but really only if they if they stabilize the country somewhat more so so is there a fraction in the Taliban that would think along such lines and say, okay, we have got to be, we have got to be a different kind of regime than we used to be. Is there any hope for that? I think if there are fractions of the Taliban that think along those lines, then they are not really the Taliban. And even if they are trying to become a part of, you know, the group, but still have this feeling that we need to kind of compromise and, um, you know, not be as, um, I don't know, extreme or, or whatever that version is. As I mentioned in my introductory um, kind of, you know, a few points that I made is uh, that, that the, the more kind of um, open to compromise the Taliban member are, the least likely they are to become uh, uh, in a in, in position of power. So it's very much, if there's any hierarchy whatsoever in this movement, um, it has to do with how, um, how dangerous each member is and how uh, uncompromising uh, they are. And uh, if they deviate a little bit, then they're less of a Taliban. I think I, um, another thing that I'm noticing is that a lot of the people who are really showing, a lot of the Taliban who are showing their faces to the Western media, um, they're actually just I think it really, they are the minority and they are the minorities within the Taliban and, and um, they are trying to do whatever they can to tell people what they want to hear right now. Um, I, I, I not only uh, don't believe that that represents all the views of the Taliban, I think there, it's a very, very strategic uh, way to kind of represent the group um, for what it's not. Matthias, one, one way of yep. thinking about it is that the Taliban have effectively spent 20 years fighting to destroy everything that has been created in places like Kabul and Herat and Mazar Sharif and Banya. Mm -hmm. um, they, they're not fundamentally, um, they, they can only really be understood as an ideology of rejection of what the Ashraf Ghani government stood for, of the kind of reforms they introduced and the kind of society they were looking at. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that they dedicated 20 years to that and that they were prepared to fight and die to destroy that uh, tells you an enormous amount about what motivates them. Because look, there were many problems with the Ashraf Ghani government. I mean, many, 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 I don't want to minimize them in any way at all. And in fact, the experience particularly, as, uh, as I was saying in my earlier remarks of people living in some of the villages in places like Helmand has been horrifying over the last 20 years. But by and large, that was still a government of technocrats, right? They were, it was by the standards of governments in the developing world, it was a pretty educated government. It wasn't a very corrupt government. It wasn't a particularly predatory or brutal government, certainly in Kabul and Bamiyan and many areas of the North, right? Mm. And the fact that that government was so offensive to the Taliban that they were prepared to organize waves of suicide bombers to blow it up and destroy it, reveals a lot and suggests that it's almost inconceivable that they would accept significant compromises or allow the creation of anything that remotely resembled the kind of government they've been fighting against for the last 20 years. I mean, it's, um, yeah. So to turn to a slightly uh, different uh, topic, there's a couple of questions uh, coming from the audience about what we can expect the the, the communication situation to be like, uh, the, the role of the press in Afghanistan, also access to the internet in Afghanistan, the ability of journalists to report to the outside world about Afghanistan. Rory, you are already starting to shake your head. Does yeah. this mean, I mean so uh, all, gonna... all of that, I mean, I want to get back to, to watch more on this, but I mean, all of that mm -hmm. will be, uh, I, I predict very, very difficult indeed. Very difficult. Indeed. I mean, journalists are already uh, being beaten up. Uh, female reporters are already being deterred from good work. It is extremely predictable that a regime like this will attempt to very quickly control the media, shut down the internet. Mm -hmm. And remember that things probably will get worse because as the Taliban government comes under financial pressure, it doesn't money, it can't run services, as there are more and more 
demonstrations in the streets as potentially other armed groups emerge that start trying to fight against them, they will become even more paranoid. Right? They will be under even more pressure to try to clamp down against their opponents, against counter-revolution. Um, so I would suggest that Afghanistan, very sadly, is likely to become a much more repressive, much more bleak, a much more closed society than it was before. Just to give you an example, just um, reminded me of my childhood when the Taliban would go to people's homes to look whether those people own TVs or any picture of a human being whatsoever, mm. uh, any books that had pictures, any books that were not religious. And if they found a TV, even though there, we did not have electricity, but if there was a TV in the room, they would break it, they would take the, the, the head of the household with them, and then the head of the household would go missing for a few weeks or never return or return after being tortured. Um, we used to bury our pictures and, and, and everything and, and wherever just to, just to avoid, you know, if, I, if we had a family picture and we, I, I own a very few family pictures actually from my childhood because of that. And we had to get rid of the TV and get rid of any pictures in the house. And, and I kind of want to relate, kind of connect that to what happened uh, last night. I think it was the last night reporting that the Taliban, as I mentioned, um, prevented the cricket players, female cricket players from participating. And one of the, um, one of the explanations they gave is that the women's face, uh, faces and, and bodies show in a way uh, that are not, you know, according to the values and the interpretation of the Taliban. And then the second thing they mentioned was that, and then their video recordings that people can play these as the women are playing, people can play and replay this. And we don't want our women to be displayed on TV. Um, there's a huge emphasis on not having women, not having um, videos, not having the faces of these. I mean, some of, some of the cabinet members don't have any pictures. Uh, the some of the um, Taliban do not believe in any image or any picture. So let alone the, the kind of journalism that's coming out of Afghanistan is um, quite impressive if you think about Afghanistan. And I do not think that goes in line with what the P Taliban envisioned for the country. I think currently it's being used strategically. Uh, the journalism in Afghanistan, the reporting, the media, internet, um, technology as a whole to kind of send a message, to kind of put people's hearts at ease that the Taliban have changed and they don't have to worry about the Taliban now. Now they are more sophisticated and educated and they'll take care of their country. That is the narrative that they want the West to hear and kind of back off because the West, you know, having, you know, the history of colonization, other interventions that we did not know how to end, it's very hard to intervene in a country that the main, you know, explanation is that we want to run our country by our own rules you can back off. So they're really trying to feed to that narrative and discourage any kind of involvement in intervention. And I don't think that the type of uh, videos and journalism and, and reports that we're seeing now uh, will continue to appear in the future. And it, 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 for me, is very troubling how many, I mean, I see this, you know, both in television stuff that I've been doing, but also on social media, how many highly educated American and British commentators are buying into this Taliban narrative. You know, I'm being attacked all the time for suggesting that Biden was long, wrong to withdraw, and I'm attacked on the grounds that this was a horrible US military occupation that was murdering tens of thousands of people, and thank goodness the Taliban, who represent the real Afghan people, have now come and liberated the country from this evil American occupation. Um, it's really bad, naive argument, this. Um, and the fact that highly informed American journalists and prominent commentators in the American left are taking this view is really disturbing. You can, of course, criticize the American presence. You can criticize the many horrifying mistakes of the last 20 years, but please don't go around suggesting that somehow the Taliban is some great improvement and that they represent some great legitimate peaceful development in Afghan life. Since uh, we are almost out of time, let me just uh, ask you one, uh, both of you, one last question. So uh, our audience members, of course, they also want to know, is there anything we can do at all? Is there anything that you're asking of us? Is there anything, anything at all on, along those lines that you would like to leave the audience uh, with maybe? Uh, Vashma, you first and then Rory. Yes, I think many, many, many things. I could spend another hour 
um, <laughs> talking about it. But but the few things that I think would be important to really uh, listen to people who are um, who are educated and well aware about the country, about the movement. Um, people like Rory, who spent who spent you know decades um, knowing the country, having lived in the country, uh, as well as really the Afghans, both inside the country as well as outside. Uh, there are little things that I noticed, for example, that people wouldn't the the reporter that the the Afghan reporter that appears on TV. I noticed that he hadn't shaved for it looked like he hadn't shaved for a couple of days, and that's because of fear because the Taliban used to force all men to grow really long beard. And if they didn't, they would beat them up or take them to torture them. And every man was required to grow a beard. Um, and so things like that, there's a lot of fear um, that we don't see if we don't look for it. And to kind of listen to those who uh, who know the movement closely and, and not really fall for the propaganda and the strategic uh, reporting that's coming out of the country to kind of make, make them appear uh, a movement that they're not. And also to never really abandon this, this country and, and what's going on because last time there was very little attention to Afghanistan and really the entire world's global order shifted um, due to that lack of attention due to that abandonment and isolation of the country um, that, that led to Al-Qaeda, that led to 9-11. So I'm really hopeful that this time around, we're really paying attention and, and being very active uh, to look for reporting and look for any ways to kind of stay involved. Um, and, and that's one of two of the many other things that people could be doing, but I, I would love for Rory to, to share his thoughts as well. My very last, very quick thought, Matthias, is please be very cautious about articulating for sanctions which hurt ordinary Afghan people. It should be possible to allow funding to go to NGOs and UN agencies which are running clinics, which are running schools, which are doing humanitarian programs without it going to the Taliban government. And we cannot sacrifice ordinary Afghan people in an attempt to try to exercise leverage over the Taliban government. Frankly, I don't think that even if you stopped all the money going to clinics and schools in Afghanistan, that would actually change the behavior of the Taliban government, it might make it even worse. So if you're doing sanctions, if you're doing stuff to try to think about exercising leverage over the Taliban government, make it very precise and make it very focused on the practical question, is this gonna change the behavior of the Taliban government? And please do not create a prolongation of the current situation. We literally cannot get money to pay the salaries of NGO staff in Afghanistan at the moment because everybody's afraid they're going to get caught up in terrorist funding regulations from the US government. So there are hundreds of thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of Afghan citizens who work with agencies and NGOs on the ground who are not receiving their salaries. There are millions of people who are not receiving services at the moment. Uh, let's please try to draw a distinction between humanitarian development work uh, and the Taliban government itself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vasma. Thank you, uh, uh, Rory. Uh, you have um, brought home the point that there is a lot to worry about uh, at this stage, uh, especially, of course, on behalf of the Afghan people, uh, also uh, for uh, as far as the rest of the world is concerned in terms of what is going to happen with Afghanistan as a staging ground for terrorism. It's definitely something that we will need to uh, will need to watch. Um, so thank you for this incredibly enriching and light that you have spent with us. Um, Bashman and Rory, please stay on the Zoom for a little bit longer. We are saying uh, now goodbye to our audience and we will stop the recording, but please uh, stay just a little bit longer. Um, but thank you to the audience for joining us on this and we hope to uh, see you back again in the car center this um, academic year. Thank you very much.